This is Asian Powerhouse. Also make sure to follow us on our podcast channel. So it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. We'll appreciate that. Follow the like and the listen as we talk about all things Web3. I'm Joyce Young, a photographer, film producer, and podcaster. Excited to be partnering with Aitchen on this new podcast. And co-hosting with me is Nicole, founder of Aitchen, a beautiful NFT collection with artwork by Mr. Hike, celebrating diversity, female pow- empowerment, and focusing on building a great community. Our guest today is Yu Opal, a co-founder of Cider, a billion-dollar value company focusing on Gen Z fashion. Pass it to Nicole for a few words and a bit more background about Aitchen. Thank you. Thanks, Joyce. It's really excited to be having this podcast with you. This is actually our fourth podcast session and it has been really exciting I to learn you know stories and backgrounds from individuals like you Kelly and all the other previous guests that we had thank you yeah it's been a great conversations uh, every time uh, Nicole so so excited to pass it like to you we give an introduction and how did you start the idea of cider and how did you get started on that Sure. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, Nicole, for having me. Really excited to be here. This is actually our first Twitter space, but I'm sure there will be many more in the future. Cider is a Gen Z fashion unicorn startup that launched in less than two years ago, as as Joyce has mentioned earlier. We started during the pandemic, so completely online only. And we just realized, you know, back in 2020, we saw this opportunity where, you know, traditional retail kind of lost the offline advantage overnight. And we thought this could be an interesting timing to enter the market. Four friends, we got together. We all share a passion for entrepreneurship, fashion, and e-commerce. So we got together and we launched Cider during the pandemic. Wow, that's amazing. Pretty bold move to do that, but people hear it often enough. You take the risk when, when it's risk, I guess. And when, when everything else is not working out, you find a solution. So this is a perfect example for that you guys got in with the opportunities and seeing also that, you know, the, the traditional fashion channels are not working as well. And I think, you know, that that's really similar to what Nicole, I mean, she, you know, Nicole, too, I mean, founding H and it's really amazing too. You started at a, a time that's, you know, also during the pandemic uh, when NFT is still, I mean, is growing but not certain it's still not certain so maybe you can speak to that a little bit i would say that is pretty relatable because i started asian during like the lockdown that we had in malaysia and uh, there was a period of time where covid was really bad where we can't even go out and then even the restaurants everything like you, we gotta close so much earlier like every day i was on my computer into nfts and i was in this whole rabbit hole like buying and investing in nfts and when i found out that there was actually no asian representation or women representation in this space that is what inspired me to start my own so that is pretty relatable but I do have a question so like during the pandemic did you see it as an opportunity where because all and everything else it was closed because of the um, COVID situation do you see that there is still a need for people to buy things online and that is what inspired you to start Cider? Yes, actually, e-commerce penetration grew quite a ton during 2020. So definitely a good timing, although they may not be buying the same kind of things. I heard, for example, loungewear was surging. Fashion is related to imagination, to, you know, individuality, and people still want that venue to express themselves. So every piece I say to every collection is inspired by, you know, these cultural references. So we could have like a 90s collection and you could easily find pieces where you know you could show up at the baby one more times music video and it's very fitting we had you know 70s collection and we also had love wonderland during the valentine's day so every collection has that its own story and obviously every season would be changing nowadays people wanting to go out more uh, compared to you know just two years ago so we we have to adapt to that as well and how did you come up with that? Like initially, you said there's four friends and did you guys already work together? How is the working relationship, you know, throughout starting the company till now? So four co-founders and we all know the CEO, Michael, for more than 10 years separately. And we are, you know, we've been good at different things. And that's how we got together with, you know, complementary skill sets and similar backgrounds. And that's how we got together. And I, I guess in terms of the look and feel, because it's quite interesting that you have a different collection based on the decades or different style, I guess, a genre. Was that mainly from, from one person, like to, to manage the style and the look of it? Or everyone kind of has to agree on the general look and feel of, of the shop? 
So just to add to the earlier question, so there's, you know, different references or decades inspiration. There's also this idea of pick a mood. So we could be feeling cute, feeling hot, feeling even K-pop. Uh, we try to make it, you know, really fun when shopping with us and people can explore different sort of genres there. Um, and speaking of, you know, the actual design, that's magic from our merchandising and design team that's led by our fashion co-founder, Fanko. So, I think with design, you, you kind of, you, you, yeah. you can make it a, how to say, like a democrat, uh, democratic decision. So that's to Fanko's leadership and uh, vision in terms of the initial design and style, how we, you know, enter the market. And I would say we probably got really lucky back then in September, in the fall 2020, the style of, you know, edgy, retro, modern retro was really on the rise. And our affordable price point, 20 to $30 dollars, was so a, you know, a good selling point and people really reacted to it. So would you say your graphics of customers are mostly on like in the States? Yes, but actually the percentage is actually shrinking because we are attracting international audience more and more. And we actually have pretty, you know, decent sized followers and fans and customers in Asia as well. I see. That's really cool. I've, I've yet to shop on ShopSider. But then Sherbet, one of our team, Cheryl, she actually shopped on your website and she actually told me that it was really good because she said that it was really affordable and the quality was good as well. And then she was recommending it to me. Yeah, so that is really exciting. And I like how you guys have different styles. You guys have like really simple ones to really edgy ones as well. Even in terms of the colors, there's like really striking ones and there's also really, what do you call it, like basic colors as well. So that is something that I appreciate about ShopSider. Yeah, we want to have enough varieties. So there's something to everyone. We had a Thanksgiving or I guess holidays collection last remember and we had you know a young girl and like a grandma you know together and shooting the campaign. We want to have that you know different ranges for sure. That is so yeah. cool. I love my grandma. Yeah, That's you really can do cool. a photo yeah. shoot with grandma. That's a great idea, right? Generational. Yeah. I do want to ask, I mean, along those lines, I mean, you started only in 2020, right? And grew very quickly. So what are some like really like key elements that made you guys stand out from other brands and have this rapid rise? I would say in terms of product market fit, the style was on the rise and, you know, the creative, the, the design that, you know, we bet on also just happens to resonate with the market and, you know, plus our very affordable price point, you know, audience really responded to it really well. And it just kind of uh, snowballed since the launch. And I would say, you know, just like from building the brand together with our, you know, the entire cider community, you know, both internally and externally over the past two years, there are maybe two other things that we probably did better where we cared more that helped us stand out. One is authenticity. So we really want to always be, you know, the best friend, right? The BFF of uh, any cider customer or cider fan. We don't want to talk down to them. We are always equal, never above. And if you look at some of the meme posts that we've shared on Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram, if the brand is a person, the person is just another, you know, Gen Z young girl or boy, right, wanting to try different sort of uh, styles and wanting to explore and has a lot of opinions and a lot of feelings, very expressive. And that's just our brand as well. Uh, We really want to, you know, continue with that authenticity and continue to connect with our fans. And the second part is the community. I know that's very big in Web3 as well, so I would love to learn more from the co and the team too later. We consider ourselves sometimes, you know, as like a, how to say, someone who participated in some sort of a idol selection reality show. You know, like when you start, you are like nobody. And then as you come along the way and you have audience cheering for you and they, you know, vote for you or they try to, you know, like influence what you will do. And that's sort of the journey for Cider as well. We have, you know, community members that we cast for our campaigns. We ask them to vote on different sort of a style preference. We name our dresses after them. And they also share sometimes, you know, their pet pictures, their acne fighting journey with us. So we want to continue to involve the community as we continue to grow. So that would be the two things that I believe helped us along the way. And then I, I'm going to ask you, Nicole, in terms of, you know, building the agent community as well. 
Yeah, I would say our story is pretty relatable. Like when we first started, we, we started during like the pandemic and that is where everyone was online. And for you, a lot of people are, I mean, we're looking into buying online because people can't go out and shop. For me, it was the blooming of the NFT and the crypto scene because everybody's at home. Everybody was looking into the metaverse, into crypto. Um, everybody was spending their time on Discord. Um, that's how they like socialize with people and stuff like that. And just kind of stay connected. And that was the whole scene for me. I met like so many people online, on Twitter spaces. And that is how we, we grew. Because when I first started, I did get a lot of bad experience in other Discord community because back then it was such a male-dominated space. So when people found out that I was an Asian woman, you know, they will start to say nasty things about me, saying that I was like the COVID creator or, or even tell me that, you know, women are not supposed to be in like in the space and then they were like kind of just say really nice and um that is how I just started the project and back then when I first started we were like nothing right we were zero how I built my community and how I how I built like the Asian brand and name was to put myself out there so I was on to a lot of Twitter spaces I was there every single day just like to people like sometimes I just jump on spaces and I don't really have anything but I'll just kind of talk about our different cultures or just to know about their background and sometimes it's, it's really funny because not everyone is as fortunate to be able to go to Asia and then sometimes they're like oh uh, why can't you speak Korean or like you know isn't Korean and Japanese the same thing and then we will just be talking about all these cultures um, and that is something that I really like sharing so that is what I wanted to do I wanted to bring the Asian culture to educate people about it in the web tree space because it is such a new world you know it's like I mean most of them right now they are from like the business world where they they kind of know you know where is Asia and everything and, and all this general knowledge but back then it was a really targeted niche people where like people just stay home and they and they, they don't go out they don't like look at the sun or like they don't take a walk the, that kind of thing so back then the whole um, targeted audience was very different. So yeah, I guess for me, we started with like 10 people on Discord and they saw we had about 100 people and then 1,000 people and then today we had about close to 15,000 people and I think that is how we, we grow and it was pretty organic. So yeah, I guess right now we are kind of learning to see how we can expand more into especially into like the real world you know so this is why I'm really excited about our partnership because that is like a bridge towards to the real world because right now even like the web NFTs they are all like huge but then there's only about 600,000 users right now in the NFT space so that is still really little compared to like the 8 billion people that we have in the world. That's true. Um, still lots of upside, right? And opportunity and reach. And it's amazing always to hear you talk about how you kept at it, right? Like just get in there, even if it's 10 people, 20, just build your Discord and your Twitter followers. So that's that's amazing to that persistence. And that's what you need, right? And as an entrepreneur and great to continue to see your partnership as well. So yeah, thanks, Nicole, cool. for sharing. That's a wonderful story. And, you know, when you start, right, you don't know what's next and you kind of just have to grind day to day and it may seem messy at first. But, you know, you back, say, three months or six months or a year, you realize, oh, my God, I've accomplished so much. Yes, exactly. Like I look back and it feels like I have been in a space for about like two years or so. And then it, was, it has only been four months since we sold out and everything. So looking back at our accomplishments wow. and what we have done for four months, like, you know, if you do this in the real world, like with a real company, whatever, most of the time people would take like maybe a year to even, you know, accomplish like all these things. So I think that is what really intrigues me about the space is that, you know, you can actually do so many things with it. And then, and time here as well, like they say like a week in crypto, is like a month in real life, right? And that is so true. So yeah, that is, I mean, that is really exciting. I do have one question. So how did you find out about like the NFTs and how did you jump into the space? I mean, have you always been like an investor in crypto or stuff like that? I would like to know. Um, so I knew crypto, I guess, even like college days, but I never participated in it. I, I knew, you know, friends would talk about it, but that's only like maybe the few nerdy friends that would talk. And then I never, you know, went deep into it. And then in 2017, I started dating this, you know, nerdy engineer who became my husband. And he was telling me about, you know, his crypto investment. I guess overall, there was like a bigger trend in general. And then 2020, you know, and NFT, the, the trend was just on the rise. I've been following it since since then. Uh, but obviously, you know, Cider kept me pretty busy 
it's, it's kind of exciting, you know, to reconnect with this other interest of mine through work now in 2022. We are, you know, pretty excited to, you know, uh, hopefully be part of the conversation, if not, you know, leading some of these trends together as a fashion company. That's amazing. Uh, I mean, you recently participated in the Decentraland Fashion Week. I mean, both Cider and uh, Asian NFT. Um, maybe you can speak a little bit about that experience. Yeah, well, I would say the Metaverse was quite an interesting experience. That is actually how we connected with ShopSider. So we were technically neighbors in the district in the Metaverse, and that is how we connected and stuff like that. But to me, I feel that this is a good start, but then there is a lot of things that can be improved because in terms of technical wise like a lot of people can't even go on the site because like if you have an older computer you can't even open or even load the screen so that is the only downside there is about the event but overall the idea and everything else i do think that this is the future i do think that even like fashion stores or even like e-commerce right next time i feel that a lot of people will actually start their business in the metaverse so you know how like boutiques have actually evolved from like last time maybe you will need to have like a retail store you need to hire staff you need to pay utilities you need to have a storeroom to, to basically set up your store and then right now it has evolved to online stores and that has saved a lot of costs you know a lot of i mean i'm pretty sure like shop cider you guys don't have like an actual store right you just have like a maybe like a warehouse or like an outlet for you to store your stocks and that actually saved a lot of costs in the future i feel that we don't even need to have an online store anymore it's just like a metaverse kiosk it's live you know everyone can just walk into your store and then just purchase things. I think that would be really interesting. And imagine if, if like the Apple store is right next to you in the metaverse and you can just walk over to, to like Apple store and buy like Apple product uh, rather than like going to your browser and, and go to apple.com. It's really interesting. Yeah, like you're already painting the future. That's That sounds really exciting. I, I would love to be, you know, neighbor to a Apple store either way, right? Like in real life or in Web3. Yeah, so like I think, you know, I share definitely, you know, the frustration with the technology or even, you know, payment infra, how glitchy it was and it's still very new. But, but it's, you know, very exciting. It kind of shows us how new it is and you know, the Metaverse Fashion Week in Decentraland showed us a, a new possibility of engaging with our fans. And as a social first brand that started during the pandemic, uh, it was only fitting that, you know, we had our store live in Web3 first before we have it in real life. And the concept of Decentraland, I'd say it's not something new because, you know, we've had, we have all had, you know, experience, you know, controlling some sort of a avatar in some sort of a computer game. But it felt different because um, I think everyone in Decentraland kind of, you know, was way more invested in that avatar, in that digital identity in the space. And it's not just a simple game for fun. Um, so I would hope, you know, with more platforms in the future, um, we can experiment, we can you know, continue to build that new digital reality and see how we can combine fashion and the digital space together better. Now, do you feel like, uh, I mean, for either one of you, people are buying items through through those events? Uh, or do you feel like it's more, uh, it helps on the marketing and then just getting people on board and then hopefully in the future, uh, people just used to going to these digital uh, or virtual shows? I would say the purpose isn't to move the sale. It was just a more of an experiment. We want to see how people engage uh, with our our store, our digital fashion, the, the whole, you know, new kind of site presented uh, in that sort of a, format i mean i was pleasantly surprised you know seeing a lot of twitter users that probably never heard of before they would you know post themselves wearing some cider pieces you know in the digital avatar and posting you know inside the cider store it's like you know new type of ugc i would say very different from what we typically repost on instagram of course and then you know there are a lot of guys too which you know i wouldn't uh, consider as our regular target audience but i was excited to you know see a completely new audience potentially new demographic you know engaging with ciders you know anything with cider our store our style our digital items uh, I, I would love to do more of this for sure cool nicole did you guys see any kind of surprising findings i mean obviously you guys are an nft brand and what three already i'm just wondering if you see any yeah surprising findings i would say that all of our, com our community that is in the 
NFT scene. They are kind of looking for like utilities and new things and then just benefits or even activities or events that will be happening in the space. I feel that everyone is looking forward to the metaverse as well of what you can become because we do hear a lot of buzz around it. Facebook investing a lot of money in it and then changing game and then having all these big plans. And everybody is really excited of what you can become. So I would say that like fashion brands, retail brands will be the next big thing in, in the metaverse and in the NFT scene. It's a really easy way for them to convert their business to it because fashion, it's really like with fashion, there is a lot of graphics and those are, are typically really fun and really creative. So this is why you see like brands like Dolce Gabbana, Gucci, you know, even like Cider, Tommy Hilfiger, they are all venturing into the space. So even with their promotions or even creating like digital wearables or um, having like their fashion show into the metaverse is something that is really easy for them to do compared to like businesses that, that we have um, in the real world. So that is something... That I, that I do see happening in the next couple of months. Yeah, so this is really exciting because we do have something going on with Cider. So that will be really exciting. Those of you who are in the room here, do stay tuned of what we have. Next month will be NFT NYC and we are planning to do something as well. So if you're around, um, do come over and check us out. Awesome. I was just about to ask what's coming up next. That's cool. We'll stay tuned. But that's a good cliffhanger <laughs> to see what, what you, um, you know, Cider and Agent has uh Co- you know collaborating uh, to do next um that sounds sounds amazing doing kind of virtual fashion digitals i guess i don't know if people still use that term there's always new terms every day but looking forward to be able to have utility both digitally and in real world so you you have a you're a holder of Asian as well and i mean uh nicole spoke to a bit about obviously the collection is giving some representation or a lot of representation of asian and female asian and ha- hoping to spread that out there and have a more empowerment around it so does cider have someone with with kind of the asian heritage uh, does it influence the brand or the just indirectly the marketing and and the business model um i wouldn't say like it has like a you know only the asian influence uh, so for us it's pretty global uh, we have teams spread out across different parts of the world but i do say you know the asian influence is there you know for example like if you look at the k-pop trend right like bts and blackpink are world known names not just in korea but globally so we we see that trend happening right now and obviously we want to celebrate trends like that and we want to also celebrate you know the overall like sort of the global influence sort of phenomena of you know different sort of global trends influencing each other yeah our teams we are actually you know spread out across i would say now probably 11 countries and asia is definitely a big part of you know where our workforce is at it is a big influence for us and i'm glad that we got to you know collaborate uh, right now in may and also in june just like continuing the conversation Awesome. Looking forward to it. You know, again, kind of speaking to some of the challenges of being a founder, but also a female founder. And Nicole kind of spoke to that as well. I don't know if you, you have any kind of specific uh, experience with that, both positive and negative experience. Oh, I do have a question as well. I, I heard that you are from China, right? And then you actually moved to states for school, is it? Or you, you grew up there? Just want to know like your background story. Yeah, sure. Yes, I, I went to the States when I was 18 for college. And I and you spent settled probably 12, mm-hmm. 13 years in the States at this point. I see. Okay, so now you are based in the States, right? Because the last time we spoke, you were you were in Thailand. <laughs> so you were like everywhere. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I travel quite quite often. So before Cider, I guess a little bit more background about me. Before Cider, I spent almost four years in tech. At first with Uber, so, you know, with the whole Uber Eats team since the early days doing, you know, analytics, operations, and product. And then I decided to go back to fashion. So I got my hands dirty with, you know, two completely different fashion jobs. One as an uh, e-commerce product manager at a, you know, also a GNC e-commerce store from San Francisco. And then another as a stylist at a high-end fashion boutique. I got to experience Black Friday in 2019, you know, before the world turned upside down on the sales floor. That was quite an experience itself. I mean, are you always interested in fashion? 
Yeah, so I grew up with grandparents that were self-taught tailors. So growing up, you know, watching them making clothes for their clients and fitting them, and、um, you know, hand stitching everything, it was pretty fascinating. I think that's how I got my initial spark, you know, with fashion. In college, I was trying to get you know relevant experiences as well, but somehow, you know, I'm not sure. Maybe because of a you know peer pressure, or simply you know. For whatever reason, I got into finance first when I graduated, and but but you know after four years at Uber, I thought you know maybe it's time to take a take a step back and really trying something that I wanted to do when I was very young. So I took pretty much a detour fashion without knowing what to do. Back when I was doing my break, I had no idea there would be something outsider, you know, waiting for me. One year later, that is really interesting. So you have been in the finance industry. So right now, are you like full time in Insider? Yes, of course. Yeah, I'm the、uh, marketing co-founder here. I have to be full time, if not more than full time. <laughs> I totally get you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, really amazing.、Right? You, you live、yeah. and breathe in it. I think it's really important to kind of find something that you like doing. You know, so even with me, I work like seven days a week, and I like I do complain about it, but at the same time, I enjoy it. There's definitely you know ups and downs for sure. It's not always like rosy for sure. Totally. I mean, yeah, I switched careers multiple times as well, so totally understand. All of that, and、uh, just how it is tough, right? So other people can see that it, it seems like a nice ride, but it definitely lots of work, lots of grinding, as you mentioned before. Both of you just have to keep doing it, right?、Um, yeah, and I guess going back to、uh, Joyce earlier question about you know being a female founder,、mm-hmm. I would say being a founder itself is hard. Maybe、yep. you know based on certain psychological biases, or being a female founder somehow it's like a separate category. You know, I I would love to. Not worry about that label too much myself. I I hope when people see me, they just see you know I guess some business leader running a very interesting you know and growing company instead of a、uh, thinking about me as a some sort of a minority. And I would say like there are you know maybe three three things that I really value and that probably you know helped us with、uh, running the cider team as well. So one is I would say like being real. But also not afraid of being vulnerable. Like sometimes I would just tell my team, you know, we are just figuring this shit out together. I don't know a lot more than you. We are just learning together, and that would, you know, just to somehow make some less nervous and stress because you know that's how I'm keeping it real and you know really acknowledging the situation. The second one is having you know empathy. I don't know if it's just being me or being female.、Uh, definitely, you know, I, I'm probably a little bit more. Sensitive, and I I can tell people's emotions,、uh, you know, bit better. I want to be there for them, and I want to, you know, really、um, think in their shoes as well, because we have, you know, folks from different backgrounds, and not everyone is always thinking about the same thing. For a lot of them, it's probably the first time, you know, doing an internship or first time even, you know, joining a startup. So it's very different.、Um, and then the third one, I would say empowerment, especially for young talents. For for cider, you know, we are a brand, you know, built by young people for young people, and having that、uh, bottom up culture and having the you know global Gen Zers telling us what to do, what should we you know say as a brand, that's really powerful, and I want to continue to have that. That's amazing. Those are good tips, and I love how that you boil it down to the three points. And I totally agree with your point of、uh, call me a founder, right, and not not have additional segment to it. But it is, you know, it is a topic, and we we do want to kind of I mean, part of the discussion is to empower women, empower Asians, empower you know different segments. So、uh, so it's good to to hear that. But but I totally agree. We should all get to the point where it's just founders, right? Just founders. Whatever you're doing well, that's your accomplishment, right? And not kind of、uh, label it. Further, so yeah.、Um, sorry, I, w- I wasn't like criticizing anything. I'm just saying that's sort of how I'm thinking about it.、Um, but you know,、oh. th- th- obviously, we-, we are all you know, Nico and I were both female founders. It's a thing. I'm not、uh, shying away from the fact. Oh no, totally. No, no, I didn't mean. Yeah, I'm just saying it's true. <laughs> we we all you know try to bring it up, but it, I mean I agree. 
fundamentally that you know, that's always how I feel as well, right? Um, doing your own thing. When people ask, well, how do you feel as a female? I was like, well, I didn't think about it. I mean, but also it is important because other people do think about that, right? So it's just they kind of want to hear what you say. It's not in the back of your mind always, right? It's just like, well, I'm just trying to start this thing. I'm a co-founder of this company or a founder of a company and just want to do a job, right? So I think it's it's interesting that way. Yeah, yeah. I totally understand because there's a few times um, I went uh, like an NFT event in Malaysia. And when, like, last time, whenever I go to all these events, there's a few times that I was the only girl in the room. Like, I was the only girl. And then there was a few times that maybe I was, um, there was only three girls. And then I tried to connect with other girls that were in the room. I was so excited whenever I see, like, women in NFTs or, like, in, in Web3. And then I go up to them and I'd be like, oh, are you part of any project? You know, and then they will, they will let me know. And then they will actually say, like, oh, I'm actually here just to, to accompany my, my boyfriend, right? And that was kind of upsetting for me. I would say that in the space, especially like in Asia, it's so rare to even find someone in the NFT space, you know, let alone to, to find like a girl. So I do, I do understand like why people do get excited whenever they see that, oh my God, like you're the founder, you like you're, you're in the NFT space. Yeah, but at the same time, I feel that sometimes it's a bit annoying as well. I'll be like, yeah, you know, it's like, what's what's the problem? Like, you know, I'm like, I'm human too. Like, I go to school too, you know? It's like, I can do amazing things, right? Things like that, basically, um, is what I have been experiencing in the past month. But right now, I think things are so much better. The last time I went, okay, oh, actually yesterday, or was yesterday? Yeah, yesterday I was actually on in a NFT event, and I would say about 30% was like girls you know so we are growing yeah the representation is so important you know the the fact that you show up you know obviously in real life but also you know digitally hosting events you know like the talks that we are having right now or you know engaging with your community and launching agent itself I, I think that's all representation so yeah kudos to you guys thank you thank you so much yeah and also thank you for like believing in us i mean and congrats on purchasing your first agent cider purchasing agent so that is really exciting. Yeah, um, so this, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this means that uh, they do own full rights to the NFT, and you guys will be producing some artworks and stuff like that for visuals and marketing that we are in the midst of planning. So that is something that I do look forward to. Ooh, things on the horizon. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah. So I do want to ask because right now that you have been into the space, like because a lot of other NFT projects are slowly noticing of your presence in the Web3 space. So would you say that in terms of like your marketing budget and your future plans, how are you allocating your budget? You know, would you be doing like campaigns in the Web3 space or would you kind of focus on to like the real world? I would say Web3 is definitely a new area that we want to explore more. So while I don't have the exact budget numbers to share, I can confidently say that it's going to be a big focus for us. We, you know, we, we are cooking something new, you know, we'd love to basically amp up, you know, the efforts for sure. That's really exciting. Yeah, looking forward to see Thank you. You know, your brand, yeah, in the Web3 space. Well, you, you guys are both Gen Z brands starting out, uh, and you're, you're in Gen Z. Just what are some tips like for other brands? Like what are, what are the main things to connect with, with Gen, Z, Gen Z population, I suppose? Yeah, I would say venturing into the space alone, regardless of what, uh, what your company does, is already really innovative. And, you know, people in the NFT space will actually look into your brand just because you are in the Web3 space. That alone um, is really empowering already. So I would say that starting early is really important um, and it can take you pretty far just, just by being early. So that is an advantage that a lot of brands can actually do. So for us, I would say, you know, well, unfortunately, I'm actually not a Gen Zer myself, but we have a big think tank, you know, all these Gen Zers across the globe on the team which I'm very grateful for. So I would say, you know, the Gen Zers are probably among the most imaginative and expressive people that I know. Very fortunate to be working closely with them every day at Cider. And I think for a brand, regardless whether it's Web2 or Web3, we really need to be authentic and also focus on the values that we provide, um, you know, especially when it comes to engaging with a Gen Z audience because, you know, they can tell the bullshit, right, very easily. Um, so you better be authentic from the start. Also, you you know, because it's a young generation, I think it's important that we continue to have fun, which is also a big part of our brand's value. We want to, you know, 
bring joy to the world. So if we really believe in the new digital world we create in the Web3 space, we'd like our audience to join the fun and enjoy this new experience together. And going back to, you know, being authentic. So for example, if they have questions, like we should have an answer, you know, ready for them. So I, I think the whole, you know, Discord format and maybe having like, a, uh, we have a, actually a little notion space as well, like having a little bit of a FAQ that also helps. I know agent on the website, you have a lot of, uh, you know, very informative FAQ as well. So I think be transparent, be real with the odds. It never goes wrong. Sounds good. Great advice. Before we close the conversation, any additional words, final words from both of you? I would say that I'm actually really excited on our partnership that is upcoming. And also really excited to see where Sida would, would go in the next few months. I would say that right now, you know, with, with Eve and everything down is actually a good time for us to build because people mm-hmm. don't have really high expectations and then which means we actually yeah. can take longer time to build mm-hmm. like quality events and campaigns in the future so that is something that I'm really grateful about and hopefully we will be able to give you guys something soon yeah thank you Nicole and Joyce for having me and yeah same here very excited in the future I agree you know right now sentiment may be down and it feels a, a little bit you know there's more turmoil around the space but if we believe in it long term you know time will tell your brand it's only been two years right so it's still new brand i would say but then you guys have actually grown a lot in the past two years that is also really really exciting thank you yeah we'd love to learn more and hopefully i can get to see you in new york next month oh yes for sure definitely that is something that i look forward to well, we're looking forward to hear more from both of you in terms of what comes next. And hopefully you guys enjoyed the New York uh, get together as well. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks audience for joining us. And uh, we'll talk soon and stay tuned for the next episode.